So allow me to introduce the panelists, and uh, they'll talk a bit about their, uh, their, their excellent book. Um, you know, starting, of course, on my far left, uh, many of you know uh, Chris Johnson, who's the Freeman Chair for U.S. India, U.S. China Studies here at CSIS, and uh, has been spending a, a, a nice strong day on bilateral relationships today, huh? I saw you with the, the, the Russia-China. The earlier today. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on to another. Um, uh, then uh, immediately uh, closer uh, is uh, Haiyan Wang, who's the managing partner for the, for the uh, China India Institute. Uh, served as an adjunct professor of strategy at the NC Business School and articles published in the Wall Street Journal, China Daily, and the Economic Times. Um, uh, next is, uh, is uh, in, uh, hopefully on the camera, it shows that uh, indeed it is a different person than me. It's not a, <laughs> a double image. I'm your twin brother. <laughs> twin brother. Twin Anil brother. Gupta. Uh, Anil is the uh, Michael Dingman, Dingman Chair uh, in Strategy and Globalization at the University of Maryland and is ranked by Thinkers 50 as one of the world's most world's 50 most influential living management thinkers. So it's great to have him on stage. And, and uh, just immediately to my left is Gira Japande, who's the executive chairman of Apex Avalon Consulting based in Singapore. Uh, he was previously served as chairman of Asia Pacific for Tata Consultancy Services. Uh, and uh, during his, uh, his tenure, received the best CEO award uh, from the Singapore Human Resources Institute. So uh, the three in the middle are the three co-authors of, uh, of the book. So uh, we'll let them uh, tell you a bit about, uh, about what they uh, had, have in their findings. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll open it up for some, uh, for some questions. So uh, first off was Girija, you want to kick? Yeah, great. <clears throat> so um, as I was building the Tata's business in China, uh, there was always a big issue of will Indian companies be able to do well in China? Will they be able to survive in China? And is it too difficult? And we also were hearing at the same time as the, as the <coughs> trade and investments were growing that the Chinese companies were actively going into India. So this was a topic which was obviously getting very, very topical. Uh, I met uh, Anil, who was at that time in INSEAD in Singapore, uh, teaching strategy. And we decided, and Anil and Haiyan have both written <coughs> extensively on India and China previously, and we both uh, decided that we should actually write a, a real story about real companies building real businesses in both these countries. I think that's where it started. So let me leave it to Anil Nauru to, to tell you how, how we went about it. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, no, I, I mean, I'll, I'll just share my perspective on uh, China and India and what got me uh, uh, interested in uh, this book. Uh, and, you know, Haiyan and I have uh, written uh, earlier, we wrote a book in 2009, Getting China and India Right. Uh, but that was actually uh, really targeted uh, at Western <coughs> multinationals in terms of how to get your strategy for China and India right. And so that got us deeply uh, uh, analytically into India and China. What is the story? And it was interesting, an Indian and a Chinese uh, writing together, uh, because Haiyan made sure that I was honest about or objective about China, and I made sure that, you know, uh, uh, that uh, let's say, we were objective about India. Uh, but it also actually, in, in living in the US, uh, that was very educated, because it helps, you know, for me, like it helped me see things about India that, uh, let's say, unless you hear a Chinese perspective on India, uh, you know, you wouldn't uh, necessarily see that. Uh, but similarly, of course, uh, you know, on China, it was fascinating that uh, in terms of conversations, uh, that at times I would uh, tell Haiyan, which is an interesting thing for an Indian to say, I said, I don't think you understand China. Uh, uh, because she was like a fish in the water, you know, about China. Uh, so anyway, so, so but then as we got deeply, so we kind of started tracking the story about China-India economic linkage. Uh, and we basically said uh, that if uh, one was to look at the China-India economic linkage, not from the lens of 2014, but from the lens of 2020 or 2025, this would be a very big story. Uh, and so essentially what we said, okay, we know about this subject. We are among the most qualified people, perhaps, to write about the subject. So let's, uh, let's do it. I think it. When it comes to writing this book, I think Gerja and Anil were a lot f uh, far more visionary than I was. And they were looking at from the lenses of 2020, 2030. Initially, I was looking at it from the lens of 2018. And I was saying, OK, you know, my consulting fees, my uh, speaker fees are paid by big multinational companies. Suppose we sell a ton of books to the Chinese, ton of books to the Indians. I don't see them 
So from a market standpoint, uh, are going to be the immediate customer, paying customers. <laughs> but but, but um, you know, that aside, I jumped in full heartedly. Indeed, if we were to look at far ahead, say 2030, and you say who would be the biggest economies in the world, number one, China, and you know, number two, probably US, and number three, possibly could be India. And neighbors, the fastest growing economies, the biggest economies, can you imagine that business not being prospering? Can you imagine the trade ties, the investment ties, the people ties not being one of the most vibrant ones? So, so initially I was not visionary, but it didn't take much persuasion for me to jump on board. Well, well, looking at that vision, I mean, I remember when I first started working on uh, India business affairs as a young staffer at the U.S. India Business Council uh, 16 years ago, there was still a question, who was going to win, India or China? They thought that it was very much a competition. And I remember in, in 2003 when former Prime Minister Vajpayee himself uh, traveled to China and saw that, indeed, uh, that question, at least in the interim, was a done question, that China had taken a step forward that, that India just couldn't match. But the question is, you know, that's still, that is today. But, but it's still evolving right now. I'd ask Chris uh, to, 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 to tell us a bit, you know, it, those of us that look at this view, China better at industry, India better at services, natural complementarity, at least they're not uh, messing around in each other's turf. Um, you know, Chris, a lot of discussion though about China moving towards a services economy, right. things like that. Can you give us a bit of a scene set or two and some of the things that are happening in China that might sure. impact this? Sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, I think actually the, the reform process that they've laid out for themselves at last fall's third plenum really will uh, shift the direction entirely of their economy, that manufacturing piece uh, because of demographics, because of markets that it's going to and so on is declining. They know this. They know they have to transition to a service-based economy. And I think that will have real implications for their relationship with India. I actually think we're in a very interesting period. And I'm glad you guys chose to focus on sort of a 2020 or 25, 20, 2030 outlook. Because right now, frankly, the dominant view, I think, in, in China is that they see the Indians as, as sort of you know, discombobulated, uh, well behind them, quite frankly, in terms of development. <laughs> Um, and, and not something to be all that concerned about, quite frankly. Uh, and with the recent election change in India, there's a lot of talk about what's Modi going to be like. I think there's an innate assumption on the Chinese side that he's dangerous from their perspective uh, and that he might, in fact, do some things with the economy that uh, uh, will uh, allow multinational corporations to actually be able in negotiations with the Chinese to say, fine, we'll pick up and go to India and, you know, and actually have it be something that's realistic as opposed to in, you know, sort of eliciting laughter from the Chinese <laughs> side when that, when that happens. So I think uh, ultimately the direction they're headed will perhaps reduce a lot of that complementarity that exists now. But I think what's been very striking is over the years how we watched the Indian side, even when there were more moves, say, from the USG side to try to at least enlist the Indians in some sort of a soft pincher movement, containment, whatever you want to call it, strategy. And, and the Indians have very deliberately and, and directly pushed back upon that. I think the Chinese have found that uh, largely, largely reassuring. Um, obviously, it's interesting to see what the Chinese are doing uh, foreign policy-wise with their neighbors, especially over these territorial disputes on what you might call China's front door, you know, the, uh, the maritime space. Uh, there have been some interesting developments with the Indians uh, along that front. I think there's a lot of strategic concern in the Indian communities that I speak to about what China may be doing there. Um, there's no doubt that they're looking west as much as they're looking east with their foreign policy and economic policy in particular. So I think it's going to be a very dynamic space and something for us all to watch uh, unfold. It'll be very interesting. Well, now you get to see Chris and I pepper our uh, panelists. Um, of course, you, you should all pick up their book. It's available outside. But apart from uh, what's merely written in the book, it's time to, uh, to grill them and see what we can learn as we look at the uh, business relationship between the two most uh, populous countries in the world. So let me, let me kick it off by asking, um, you know, I guess the big, uh, the big question that hangs out there anytime that we talk about India, China, uh, business relations, and I think, Anil, this might be best for you. Um, India has a massive trade deficit with China in goods trade right now. Um, it's a huge component of their total trade mm -hmm. deficit. Um, India's put up some barriers that have, you know, uh, unintentionally, we presume, harmed American companies in their trade. Um, you know, how, how, why is this trade deficit quite so high? And should India be worried about this, you know, looking forward over this period? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would say two things. So, uh, number one, uh, the trade deficit is not high. 
uh, which I'm sure you know the Indian media would find you know kind of an appalling statement. If you're uh, tweeting about this, uh, the, it's uh, uh, CSIS uh, Live. Hashtag, and, uh, hashtag CSIS and, uh, Live, because that one uh, might get a little and, attention. And, 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 I'll t and I'll talk about why I say it's not high. And second, it's not an issue for India. Okay, which again is sort of counter uh, to I think the the mainstream uh, point in India. And the reason why I say it's not high is because ultimately every country, you know, you cannot expect. Uh, trade to be balanced with every country. So you, yes, you want it balanced globally, but not with every country. And if you look at India's trade deficit of about $200 billion, uh, uh, of that, the rough, it's only 20% of the trade deficit that is with China. You know, 70% of India's trade deficit is, pertains to energy. Uh, and so if India is concerned about its trade deficit, which it must be, the problem isn't China. The problem is energy imports. Uh, and so therefore, so that's number one. Number two is that India's trade deficit today is 20% of its total trade deficit. But I looked at the figures. You go back to 2001. It was 30% of India's trade deficit, you know, trade deficit with China. And over the entire decade, the trade deficit has hovered in the 25 plus minus trade deficit with China as a percentage of total, India's total trade deficit with the world. So it's not going up, okay? So that's why I say it's not a big issue. In fact, num also is that what China essentially sells to India, it's not <clears throat> toys and consumer goods. I mean, you see them, but you, you know, look at the billions of dollars, bulk of it is capital goods. And so of course, if Chinese capital goods are 30% cheaper and they come with you know, uh, low cost financing, uh, I mean, I would say more the merrier. If Chinese want to give it away for free, we should, you know, say even better, you know, <laughs> uh, because what China is doing is to accelerate uh, India's infrastructure buildup, you know. So, so, so that that would be my perspective on the trade deficit uh, issue. Also, another thing, you know, is that ultimately what India should be worried about is not trade deficit, but what's really good for India. You know, you take China-Japan relationship. I mean, if there was a relationship between any two large economy economies that is fraught with tension. You can almost say with enmity, with hatred perhaps, okay? It is that. Despite that, despite the size of China's economy, you know what? China runs a trade deficit vis-a-vis -vis Japan. Japan exports more to China than China exports to Japan. It's not an issue with China because ultimately what China is buying from Japan is high-end capital goods. So therefore, what one should be doing, what India should be doing is what goods for, what's good for India and not get caught up in, oh, we have this trade deficit of $40 billion, who cares? So they should increase the trade surplus they have with the United States. To make up for that. <laughs> right. uh, that's yeah. going to be painful. Let, 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 me, let, me, let me add a, another dimension which we talk about in the book as well. The Asian, the Asian supply chain and the Asian manufacturing is all hubbed around China. The supply chain end there, they start there. India has not got into the Asian supply chain. So the Apple is picking various components and assembling them, it all happens in Asia without India entering into the picture. So that is because of the lack of Indian manu export manufacturing. As India is not an export manufacturer beyond a point, it can never get into the Asian supply chain. And as it can't get into supply chain, Asian supply chain, it has landed in normally running trade deficits because we have to import that from Chinese. We don't export anything from India other than either raw materials or intermediates, not even that too much. So unless the Indian manufacturing is focused towards export manufacturing, you will continue to have what I call a structural deficit in this area. Mm -hmm. And, and if, you, if you borrow a page from how China boosted its manufacturing capabilities in becoming an export powerhouse. And uh, back in the, you know, in the early 80s, you know, that's when you know, China really leveraged the technology, the equipment, and, and later on the electronics components from not just Japan, but from Germany, from mm -hmm. South Korea, from Taiwan, and making China a magnet for attracting all of these foreign technologies manufacturers to build the manufacturing capabilities in China in the same way Fast forward today, and you know, China's labor cost is so far more expensive than that of India. I think the moment it has come mm. for India to take this moment to be the magnet for attracting 
all of these foreign investors, not only from China, but from around the world, and build India's global competitiveness. Mm. And that's the end game. Uh, well, I think that uh, touches very much on what you just said and also the 2025 kind of time frame and arc. Uh, in the book, you suggest that India-China economic ties could be Asia's best kept secret. Um, how would you describe the relations between the two as compared to, say, each country's relations with other emerging economies, ASEAN, Latin America, Africa? How do you see that situation? Uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of trade, China is... India's largest trading partner, you know, of course, Anil talked about the trade deficit, and uh, India is China's, used to be China's 10th largest trading partner. In the last two years, trade has come down. Now it's probably the 12th. Relative to the other major trading partners of China, the EU, the US, the ASEAN, China does a 400 billion trade with ASEAN versus China does about 100 billion uh, trade with Malaysia versus 65 billion with, uh, with India. So it's so a relatively important China uh, as a trading partner is far more important for India versus the, the other way around. Mm. But I think that you know, from a 2030 standpoint, uh, the bigger story is really the story about FDI. Mm -hmm. Now when, 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 when China look at the big market or look at the multiple uh, mag magnitude of opportunities in China say, you know, we are the largest market, we are the biggest resources, we are resources in terms of talent. And, and, and they look not too far in their neighbor, uh, India. So, so it's not just a trade story, I think that it's the, the FDI story will become far more important uh, to play out. Yeah. And uh, ASEAN is obviously one of the alternatives as the Chinese uh, competitiveness in terms of both the cost structures and the availability of uh, skills. I mean, China has an aging problem before it gets rich, as they say. So there is an availability problem, especially of blue collar workers and, uh, and the cost that have gone up in the last five years in double digit terms. With the currency going north and the Indian currency going south, the parity is nearly 10 is to 1 now. So from that perspective, it makes sense. However, as India sometimes runs an obstacle course for foreign investors, they had thought that they would go into Vietnam or Thailand or many of the, or Indonesia or many of the uh, ASEAN countries. Now, all of them A, are smaller markets and they are also export markets. So they don't have a home market which are large enough other than Indonesia. So ASEAN has a challenge and then of course with Vietnam you've had a political issue recently. Thailand has had its own internal issues. So India at the moment looks a very stable political setup for the Chinese. Mm. The equation, manufacturing equation is right, but the obstacle course remains. <laughs> and we mm. presume that the Modi government will remove the, the, this huge obstacle course that everyone has to run in India before they set up something. And that's, that's where I think the Chinese are hoping because they have seen him in action, they have seen him in Gujarat, and I think that's what they're hoping. Otherwise, India to them becomes a very important market, mm. just as a home market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, I mean, I completely agree. But just to add another spin to it, which is that, you know, when I look at trade, or not just trade, but economic relationship between two countries, that it's driven not just by what's happening in terms of friction or lack of it or warmth in the linkages between the nodes, but just what's happening at the nodes themselves, you know, mm -hmm. so it's like reforms in China, uh, or similarly what's happening in India. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at India's GDP, roughly about two trillion, which is the same as the whole of ASEAN, mm -hmm. slightly smaller than Brazil, mm -hmm. same as the whole of Africa. So it's so when the Chinese look around, of course, if you you know take out Japan or U.S. or Europe, uh, India is a very large economy, mm -hmm. uh, and here it's one economy as compared to you know 55 countries in Africa or you know, uh, uh, in, uh, 12 or 13 in uh, ASEAN, you know, in Southeast Asia mm -hmm. and so on. So, so, of course, if India basically, the direction in which it was going in the last five years, so if India, you know, uh, essentially is on a glide path to history, uh, then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, of course, if Indian companies themselves, you know, Tata's and others are not investing in India, why would the Chinese or the Americans or anybody else invest in India? Mm -hmm. But if the Indian economy, from where it is right now, begins actually, you know, if Mr. Modi is like a Deng Xiaoping of mm -hmm. India, 
uh, then suddenly, you know, in this, the, 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 the relative interest of one node in, uh, or in, in the other node changes dramatically. Sure, sure. You know, so I, th I, th I see that's I, th I think I know the answer uh, based on what you, you, you've said to that question, but let's hit it specifically. So Narendra Modi elected prime minister, uh, best case scenario, India's economy becomes more competitive uh, in the areas that China has been extremely competitive at in recent years. What does that do for the government-to-government -government relationship? Obviously, there's going to be opportunities for business, but for government-to-government, -government, um, will, that, will that trigger a reaction in China? Will they put up barriers potentially? Will they welcome it? Um, you know, what, what do you think might the, uh, might the reaction be to Modi in a more competitive India? I think certainly the Chinese are looking for a more competitive India from the point of view that their companies can come in and invest. Their companies can come in and grow. And, and as one of the chapters in the book talks about, we've talked about five case studies of Chinese companies who have succeeded in India. And you, you know, in, in any new relationship, you need some, some of these success stories, both sides. And I think when, when, and some of them are SOEs. So when you see that there are success stories happening, then it's the question of asking if they can do it, why not? I always give this example. When the Japanese came to India in the 80s, they found it very difficult and after some time they gave up, effectively. The Koreans came to India and built a huge brand of all their companies. Today, the Korean brands, whether it is Samsung, Devu, Hyundai, LG, have just taken the market. And I say that the same thing to a lot of American companies who have not been successful. How is it that the Koreans in the same structure have done well? So Chinese are actually looking at the way the Koreans did it. And actually, the success of those five companies is exactly ground up, hiring local people, getting their expertise or whatever technology they can bring in, and succeeding. And these five companies have succeeded. So I think these success stories that are, are being now written about are the ones which will drive some of these companies in, the bigger guys. The SOEs want to come in, the, the petroleum and oil companies want to come in, set up a refinery, the banks want to come in. I mean, these are the big SOEs out of the 300 SOEs China has. Well, in terms of uh, how China, I mean, I don't really know, but from what I can read is, is Chinese government see the India moment as opportunities. And then again and again, the Chinese government emphasized that the China dream is for peaceful development. Both countries are very poor, amongst the poorest. China needs to lift up the living standard. India needs to lift up India, uh, living standards. So the China dream and, and the Indian dreams are essentially, in some way, common dreams, is to become richer, more prosperous. So that common pursuit of that common dream requires a peaceful co coexistence and then become a lot more pragmatic in finding ways to cooperate rather than just focus on the rivalry part. I think that message is far more dominant uh, in the Chinese media, in the thinkings of the Chinese government than, say, rivalry. Perhaps because of that vision that in the Premier Li, first foreign visit was to, to, to India. Uh, the first foreign leaders to congratulate Moody said uh, becoming prime minister is the Chinese prime minister and inviting uh, Modi to visit uh, China, uh, uh, no, inviting President Xi to visit India uh, perhaps later this year. All of this, I think, reflects that vision of emphasizing that common dream. So. Yeah. Also, you know, kind of to, to look at, the, as you said, you know, from the, the, the bigger government to government uh, relationship uh, perspective, uh, is uh, that. Unlike, say, the China-Japan relationship, uh, there is much less emotional baggage mm -hmm. in the China-India relationship. Uh, and also, because of the way both sides have managed the border issue for the last 30 years, you know, as we say in the book, the guns have been silent. Uh, and, that while, and, and, and leaders on both sides have explicitly stated mm -hmm. that we don't know if in our generation we will find a solution, but we will find a peaceful solution, mm -hmm. you know, which is not what the leaders, say, between, uh, of China and Japan are saying. Uh, <laughs> you know. uh, and and so, so that just to basically say that there is much less emotional baggage in the mm -hmm. China-India relationship. I don't think that the relationship will become warm and fuzzy anytime soon, uh, you know. But at the same time, uh, it would be essentially 
a, a case of economic pragmatism. You know, uh, that's how I see. And, and also, kind of just to add another thing is, you know, I mean, I, uh, just having gone and uh, I'm on the board of a Chinese company and, you know, I've given many talks in China, so kind of my own take uh, based on that is uh, that, of course, if China had its brothers, it would rather be the only superpower, okay? Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, here kind of I'm putting words in quote unquote their mouth, uh, is that uh, China has concluded that there is not a whole lot they can do uh, to prevent the rise of India. Uh, and particularly now, if Mr. Mr. Modi plays out uh, uh, as it's hoped for, as it's expected, uh, then in fact, uh, prospects are very high of two things. That would be very interesting. Uh, so number one, that within the next five years, we are likely to see, and the papers would be writing about it, you know, Wall Street Journal, page A1, and FT, uh, uh, the, the front page, that India is growing faster than China. Uh, now, of course, you know, India is you know, uh, a quarter that of China, so it's not that India is going to catch up with China anytime soon, but the fact that India consistently grows faster than China still would be big news, <coughs> and from a country branding point of view would be important, number one. Number two is that by 2025, prospects were decent, but now they look more than decent, uh, that India will be the world's third largest economy. And so if it's China, US, and India, as Haiyan was saying, uh, and the Chinese can't do a whole lot about it, uh, and you don't have that emotional baggage, uh, then, you know, pragmatically from China's side, you know, let's figure out, you know, how we make the most of it. I think uh, also there are other forums where the government-to-government -government relationships are separate from the issues of the border. So if you take the border issue away, which for India is a big issue, but if you, emotionally, but from the Chinese side, uh, many people don't even remember the 62 problem. As one Chinese friend of mine said, at that time we were struggling with the, the, the cultural revolution, so we weren't bothered about what was happening on the border. Whereas Indians still remember it, and I think that becomes a big issue with the media, so that keeps playing up. But if you look at it, global governance is too, is, and environmental issues. India and China have common views on this in the global forums. Wherever you look at the, whether it was Copenhagen, whether it was uh, Cancun, India and China have actually worked together very closely on issues of uh, environmental and what will impact the two countries as they grow. Second, on global governance uh, issues, whether it is the UN, whether it is the, uh, the uh, IMF World Bank, very common views on how global governance should be run. Uh, so there are, there are commonalities as they both look globally uh, in, in their viewpoints. Now, border issue, I think, has been put away. It's not going to go away in a hurry. Uh, there are issues there, but it's a quiet border. There's effectively, average height is about 16,000 feet. So it's not exactly uh, 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 something which everyone's dying to get in, uh, get in there for. So I think there are, there are going to be, uh, these are the mitigating issues which will drive the commerce. Yeah, and Anil, you said that uh, the relationship is not exactly warm and fuzzy. I think that it's perhaps the Indian's way of looking at the relationship. Uh, the Chinese perhaps see the relationship as warm. Uh, that reminds me of a, of a, of a Pew uh, survey of the attitude. When they surveyed the Chinese about how the Chinese see the Indian relationships, uh, some 39% of the Chinese surveyed see the relationship as being cooperative, but only 24% of the Indians see the relationship as being cooperative. And if you survey most of the Chinese randomly, you know, anybody in my generation growing up in the, in the 60s and 70s, um, not, we were born not right around the time when a war happened, most of us couldn't recall. Mm -hmm. And then, but if you survey the Indians, uh, that's still bitter memory. Mm -hmm. So I think that you know, the, the eyes looking at the relationships perhaps are warmer on the Chinese side than on the Indian side. The loser takes a longer, longer oh, yeah. time to forget. That's what I, was I was asked, uh, you know, when I, that you know, may have to do with the I, I, symmetry, I, but I, I did a joint venture with the main Chinese government. So I used to have a lot of chats in Beijing late at night in the tea shops. And they said to me, oh, but our relationship is like tongue and teeth. You know, we are so old, such an old relationship. And I said, whose tongue and whose teeth? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, one thing I think that's so interesting uh, about the subject you tackled, I mean, it really is a new area, is looking at the companies, right, uh, operating in each other's economy and, and seeing that dynamism that you guys describe in the book. Uh, but what would you say you would describe as the harder situation? Is it, is it for Indian companies operating in China or for the Chinese companies in, operating in India? And to the degree you talk to those firms and so on, how do you advise them to be more successful in the respective economy? Yeah. I, if, 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 let me just okay. add one kind of an, an sure. overview and then uh, kind of, you know, which is not at, at the more macro level, mm -hmm. uh, just building on, Chris, what you were saying, is that there are two ways in which an Indian company can play in China or a Chinese company can play in India. Uh, way, you know, one way is you go direct. So it's like Tata Consultancy Services going to China and investing and uh, doing business and all, all of that, or Huawei coming to India. Mm -hmm. The a second way, which actually I think over the next 10 years will be much bigger, perhaps, at the corporate level, mm. uh, is that a, an Indian company buys a multinational company in Europe or the US mm. or Korea, which has operations in China, mm. or a Chinese company buys, uh, you know, because both Indian and Chinese companies are in the global M&A game. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if I think about, okay, Geely from China, the car company, you know, what is the possibility that Indians would welcome a car from China? Okay, and branded Geely. Mm -hmm. The probability as a business strategy person would say is zero, right? End of case discussion, let's talk about something else. <laughs> but, you know, Geely buys Volvo. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the chance that a Volvo car mm -hmm. could do very well in India? The answer is yes. Tata Motors, can you sell a Tata branded car in China versus mm -hmm. can you sell a Jaguar Land Rover? Mm -hmm. So I think what we are likely to see over the coming few, you know, uh, five, ten years mm -hmm. is a lot more of these third country stories. That's a great point. Well, I think building a, a local brand is, uh, I, in my consulting business now, we are at the moment working with a large Indian consumer products company to acquire a consumer product company in China. They already have two or three consumer product companies, small ones, niche ones in South China, want to keep the brand, but because they can't build an Indian brand there, they are coming through Singapore or any other entity and acquiring brands in China. So that's the, what, what, what Anil is saying, that, that that is going to happen, the third party acquisition, third country acquisitions that are going to happen. I, when you look at Chinese companies in India or Indian companies in, in, in China, very early stages. Uh, Chinese total FDI stock in India, 800 million, that's 0.2% of China's total ODI stock. Indian's FDI stock in China, 500 million, 0.4 percent. That is hardly anything. So, so in terms of both countries' companies paying attention to each other, infant stage, mm -hmm. very early stage. And then if, if I have to say, at this point of time, which companies are more competitive in the other, comp in the other country, I would say Indian companies mm -hmm. tend to be doing better in China than Chinese companies doing better in India, simply because Indian companies are more globally competitive. They have been at the journey of globalization much longer. Mm -hmm. and, and so their, their educational level, their skills, their organization capabilities, their management, the leadership, vision, et cetera, and I think that have all been far more global and, <coughs> and uh, operating in a democratic society, and et cetera, et cetera. But, but what Chinese companies do have are you know, the strength capital. Mm -hmm. As Anil said, and Giriji mentioned it as well, if they started to acquire capabilities and use that acquired global capabilities to compete in India, then, then there is a game to play. Mm -hmm. uh, well, one of the things that was uh, covered in the book to some extent, like a lot of times when American companies think about investing in China and even to a lesser extent India, we think, is this the kind of investment the government's going to like? Will they allow me to do it? Um, will I be successful based on interactions with the government? And then you read, and this dynamic where, you know, again, at CSIS, we think of everything through a defense, strategic, geo, you know. Um, and you think India, China, there's some tensions, there's some discomfort with trade. And then you read with the welcoming arms in certain cases that Indian investment was welcomed into China to an extent that, you know, was, was really mind-blowing for me. Uh, I wonder, can you touch on that? How is it that in some cases, 
not only were the doors opened and allowed, but in fact, aggressively encouraged in a way that you know, is, is, is difficult to comprehend in other markets. Yeah, so I think the, the Chinese were very keen on certain sectors from, from India, and the IT sector was certainly one of them which was targeted. That, and they set up a, an office called Sino Indian Cooperation Office to attract Indian IT companies into China. So that was one sector where actively red carpeted, and as I belong to the largest one, I benefited from that red Isn't carpet. Isn't that the only carpet they have in China? <laughs> <laughs> No, they had very clearly decided that the Chinese IT industry was way behind and it needed a dose of competition, a dose of consolidation, and if you brought in the Indian, not only technology companies, but also uh, educational companies which, which you know, create skills in IT, and one of the case studies is NIIT, which, which every year produces 30,000 uh, IT trained people in China, is the largest uh, IT training company in China today. And so they actively uh, kind of wanted us there. And I, the, one of the examples I give, as we set up in Hangzhou first, uh, we were trying to uh, talk to the mayor. He was said to me, anytime you come on a Saturday, Sunday, I'll be there. You just open the door. And it was phenomenal what the, the, the red carpet that we got. And I initially, we sent about 30, 40 Indians before we started hiring the Chinese. And now, of course, there are about seven, 800 people there. And I said to him that, you know, one of the things that our Indian team is uh, finding difficult is not the language, but they are all, most of them are vegetarians. So what do we do? Uh, and in China, vegetarian is, is kind of not, not known that very well. So the three months later when I went there, the mayor asked me the first question, have you visited our Indian restaurant that we've set up in Hangzhou? <laughs> and I said, did you set it up? Yeah, your guys are all going there now. So this was the level of red carpet. Now this is not, they, they do it for many countries and many companies. This is the way the, the mayors of good uh, provinces and cities have run the red carpet for many things. And that was an experience which was really something to, to, to which I talk about many times when I go to India. Mm. Yeah. Which, which actually, you know, just, just to pick up on what Girja said, is that, you know, if we look ahead again, you know, 2020, 2025 perspective and so on, et cetera, is that, you know, I tend to take, you know, of course, you know, the political leaders talk about it, you know, the kind of, you know, nice, warm, you know, good, good PR words is that we have complementarity, you know, kind of hardware, software, manufacturing services, uh, et cetera. But, you know, a good chunk of that is just nonsense in the <laughs> sense that, uh, you know, when we say India is not strong, in, it, India is very strong in IT services, but you look at IT services as a, you know, what percentage of the total service sector or what percentage of the total GDP, it's, it's a niche, right? And so the reason India looks strong in services is because India is very weak in manufacturing. Okay. Uh, and so now, of course, you know, India is likely to go on to you know, basically like a madman, which is good you know, in, a, in a good way, to become a strong manufacturing power. And it will need China's help. Uh, of course, it will need Japan's and the US, and you know, it will need help from every corner of the, of the world. Similarly, China, as Chris, you, know, you were saying, it, you know, major plank of its reform is to go into services, and particularly not the low-end services, but into high-end knowledge-intensive services. And in knowledge-intensive services, India is very strong. Mm. And so China will need India's help. So, so therefore, we see kind of this future uh, of where working with each other, but not only with each other, uh, that we are likely to see more a convergence rather than complementarity. Mm -hmm. India becomes strong in manufacturing and of course remains strong in services and similarly China. Mm -hmm. So your assessment really is that in that kind of manufacturing intensive sector where the Indians do want to make some breakthroughs, do you think there's opportunities for the success for them in China then? Sounds like it from your I think so. And then just, you know, and, and, and in fact, you know, the, the other day I had a dream at night, I woke up and I said, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know which is really, okay, so how does India fix its a trade deficit with China, you know, although I said it's not an issue, uh, or not a big issue, is that, you know, China's manufacturing wages are significantly higher than India's. The problem is that India doesn't have the scale and India has horrible infrastructure, and so that eats up, you know, the wage advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that Chinese set up industrial parks in India, right? And as, uh, and, 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 uh, as the scale in India begins to increase, that actually Chinese companies start manufacturing in India mm -hmm. for the Indian market mm -hmm. and to export back to China. Back to China. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So this is an interesting one, which actually we talked about in, in, in the book as well. This, we've taken the example of, say, auto components. So China exports about 100 billion plus. India exports about 19, 20 billion plus of auto components. And we take a case of one of the auto components company, which is now in China, the Indian component company in China. If you see, all the big OEMs globally are now in China. This is the largest car market. There is no debate. Everyone has to be there. So they need their supplier base to come in. So they, all the Indian auto component manufacturers who are sitting anywhere else are also expected to set up there. Now, if India is today 3 million passenger market, everyone is expecting it to grow as well in the next five years. So all the OEMs are expected to be there as well. So they're saying, well, the Chinese auto component manufacturers have to also come in. As the Indians are going into the auto component market in, in China. And we're actually at the moment doing a project where we're comparing the competitiveness of the two auto component manufacturing companies mm. funded by Ministry of Commerce. Mm. How do we? So this is just one of the cases where the OEMs are now, the global OEMs, the General Motors, the Fords, the Volkswagen, they are all in both these economies in large numbers. So they need component manufacturers, tier one, tier two suppliers. And both these are going to be major areas which will drive manufacturing in both countries. I, I, and I think Chinese companies also see immense amount of opportunities in infrastructure building. Sure. Which country has built the most number of infrastructure in China? Deep port, mm -hmm. highways, high-speed trains, yeah? in a city. India wants to build 100 smart cities, wants to build the largest, you know, one of the largest uh, you know, you know, high-speed train networks. And, and Chinese, Chinese have the equipment, have the mm -hmm. experience have the experience to share, and plus, they are willing to provide a low cost of financing. That's a big plus, as compared to the European companies, the company, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, and uh, Japanese, Japanese companies. It's this willingness to go in there with a much longer horizon, because oftentimes it's a state-owned banks financing state-owned enterprises, so the horizon could be much longer than the Japanese companies. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that when it comes to infrastructure financing and building. The Chinese companies would play a bigger role than the Japanese. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Japanese and even makes most of us in America uh, jealous because uh, they're doing such bigger projects in India than even we are. So if, <laughs> if Japan's only middle of the road, then this big infrastructure boom we may see, you know, uh, America may be just a, a tiny dot. <laughs> Except that some of the some of the Chinese companies may be you know partially owned by the American companies. So yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, that is uh, one of the big questions, though. So if the Modi government a big infrastructure build out to enable manufacturing takes place um, you know where will the where will the money come from where will the uh, the companies come from to build that out and you know Japan's been doing quite a bit already you know America I keep referencing you know what some of my first work in India was trying to uh, resolve a lot of the contract disputes from the big power projects American companies build in India I don't know there's a great appetite to go back in um, but how much how, how welcomed would would Chinese companies and investment be in building critical infrastructure to make this uh, industrial development happen? I think, I mean, the, the, the way I see is uh, that, uh, you know, I mean, for decades, for centuries, uh, business uh, entities have figured out how to work with each other even though you don't trust each other or you don't know each other. So, for example, I, I j j just give two uh, illustrative examples of how things can work out. So, take high speed trains. Now, in the case of high-speed trains, obviously, there are certain things which are very sensitive from a national security point of view. So, you know, and uh, that would the Indian government anytime soon uh, allow a Chinese company to actually own a train network and the, you know, prospects are zero. But at the same time, could a Chinese company uh, come in and set up a locomotive manufacturing plant, a coach manufacturing plant? Could a Chinese project management company uh, come in to actually lay the tracks? Uh, absolutely, because you know, it's, it's a little bit like buying Sany bulldozers. You know, it's not a national security issue because the bulldozer doesn't know where it is, you know, kind of thing. Uh, so that's uh, you know, uh, one way. Uh, Hashtag live, the CSIS live, remember. <laughs> the bulldozer doesn't know where it is. Uh, well, actually, maybe, you know, ask Google this, no, it does. <laughs> uh, <the laughs> but but an, another way in which it could play out is, for example, take, you know, large special economic zones. Mm -hmm. Clearly, there is mistrust. And do you really want uh, Chinese to be owning a huge, you know, special economic zone? Probably 
you know, that, that will not happen. But what could happen, in fact, I'd be willing to say better than 50% chance it could happen, is that uh, a Chinese entity or a Chinese consortium now works with the Tata's or Birla's or Ambani's and set up and it's a joint venture. And maybe, you know, the Singaporeans come in. And if it's a joint venture like that, you know, who in India is going to say, oh, I see security issues mm -hmm, there, mm -hmm. you see? So I think these are ways in which uh, security concerns and mistrust uh, can essentially, without saying convert mistrust into trust, no, we continue to mistrust each other, but hey, we can do business with each other. I well, think the, the Huawei story was the challenge for India, yeah. uh, which is a challenge for many, many countries. So I think that has got kind of misconstrued as if every issue will become a Huawei security issue. Uh, having said that, uh, Huawei has sold a huge amounts of telecom equipment to Indian uh, providers, uh, and therefore that issue is the security issue which people talk about. I think the other side has not yet. I mean, in the Indian power plant, think of this. Shanghai Electric and Dongfang Electric have anywhere between 12 to 15 billion dollars of orders from Indian power manufacturing companies, power producing companies. Actually, if, if some of the power, produce, uh, power orders are canceled from India for whatever reasons, the overcapacity in China today will be substantial. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there is no other market which requires power equipment of the capacity that India needs. I mean, you know, don't have to be a genius to realize mm -hmm. uh, when you go to India to realize that there is a huge need for power capacity. India does not have those power capacity as yet. And the Chinese have been supplying power plants for the last 10 years. Initially, there were teething problems. Now they're setting up servicing companies, et cetera, et cetera, to, to, to uh, take away some of the issues that happen uh, with the new power plant. But that's, that's the scale of the, 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 how they are getting joined at the, at the hip on power plant equipment. Well, uh, we're at about a half hour here left. So uh, one of you have been to a conference that actually ran on time completely. We've done it. So uh, mark this down. Uh, we're going to take questions from the audience. Um, please uh, let us know who you are. Um, and we should have a microphone, Samir, coming around. Is there? Oh, OK, great, please. Uh, just right up to the front here. Yeah. Uh, let us know who you are. And if you're addressing it to a specific panel member or if it's going to be a general question, please keep it brief uh, and, and keep it to one question. And if we get through the room, then we can ask, have second questions too. Hi, I'm Dr. Donna Wells. I'm an expert in the Russian language internet. Um, how is India going to overcome its systemic corruption problems moving forward? Thank you. That's a big one to start with. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to answer that? <laughs> I thought we, we were, all want you to answer that. <laughs> I thought we were going to talk about, I mean, the corruption. And are, are you trying to compare the two, or are you saying how India is going to solve it? Um, in the last five years we have seen a transparency in India which has never been seen before. That transparency has come for various reasons, both legally, the, the Right to Information Act has been implemented. So that is the legal side of it. Increasingly, we have just passed the, the Lokpal Bill, which is the, the ombudsman, uh, which has been an independent body which will look at that. So legally, a couple of things have happened as there has been a huge reaction by the Indian middle class on the corruption issue in India. So it's a very much right and center in, in, in India. In any newspaper, if you see the headlines are corruption issues. In fact, I always say it's always, whenever you go to India, you, you read the headlines and you feel very sad. When you go to China, you, you read the headlines, you feel very good. And I'm saying both the countries are the same issues. It's just the headlines which worry, right? So you, you, you've got the corruption issue right in the center of the political spectrum. And actually, the, the, the reason one of the reasons BJP had such a huge success was around the corruption issue. So I think the, the system, the democratic system, is put, throwing it up. The politicians are creating the legal frameworks which are available in many countries, independent judiciary, independent investigating agencies, uh, you know, putting um, resource allocation on, on, uh, on, on some kind of a auction system like we have done for the telecom auctions. So I think some of those things are going to really uh, uh, catch up on uh, the, the crooks who think they can move the system. Now, will it take away all corruption? I, I don't think anyone is saying that. But I think 
probably the worst is over in terms of that. Probably India has recognized that as if you go forward, you cannot allow this kind of uh, corruption to pervade. Uh, very strong sentiments being expressed by both sides in the political spectrum. Uh, the middle class, which is now nearly two and a half, two and 250, 300 million people, are up in arms. You have seen the reaction that has happened. Very few countries have actually seen such a reaction from the middle class, that the whole government has been displaced completely, with the result that there is really no opposition today. Uh, and uh, clearly, the corruption issue was one of the very major issues on this. Just to, 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 to add another kind of, you know, from, from a uh, uh, like more uh, abstract logic perspective is, but hopefully valid, uh, is that the reason emerging economies are called emerging and they are, you know, either low income or middle income uh, is because uh, they have weak institutions. And, and of course, you know, when, when you have weak institutions, both political system, weak, uh, bureaucratic system, weak, the market system, weak. So when you have weak institutions, there are going to be opportunities for corruption. Uh, and in fact, I don't think one can flip uh, the coin from you know, uh, emerging to rich in one day or institutional weakness to institutional strength in one day. So it takes time. Uh, but so, so, so the key really, I mean, you know, China and India, of course, you know, we write a lot about China and India. They've been competing with each other in terms of who can be the more corrupt uh, in the world, right? Uh, and so, but leaders on both sides are trying very hard. Uh, and that's really the goal. You know, you can't go from dirty to clean in one day. We let India win that competition. <laughs> Uh, all the way in the back, he had his arm up the entire time. That question was going on, very persistent. Hopefully it's a, yeah, let's see. Hello, my name is Sahan. I'm interning here in Washington, D.C. I'm originally from the University of Iowa from Iowa City. So uh, my question is, probably, well, the whole panel could pitch in. In the World Bank uh, ease of doing business rankings, uh, China and India is actually ranked uh, pretty pretty low, you know, even though they are both rising economies. I was wondering what has the government and both the private sector has done to improve the ease of doing business so that Western companies or even company, emerging, co emerging market companies can invest in both, both in these really growing economies and markets? What has the U.S. government done or what have their no, own what governments done? Oh, Indian and Chinese. Oh, sorry. Uh, what the Indian and the Chinese government sure. and private sector has done. So if you see if you see the World Bank statistics, India comes around 120th in the ease of doing business, and China comes around 60th. Um, so that's the, the ranking, and clearly they're very poor, both. Uh, China is certainly ahead uh, in, in, in ease of doing business, and I think this is the obstacle course I was talking about earlier in India that we have to fix in, in terms of ease of doing business. That is one of the major issues, both for domestic investors. They are as, uh, as much in a, in a fix as the foreign investors. So the argument is that any investment should be smooth and a pro-business attitude or to investment and, and, yeah. and, and it needs yeah. to be done. Yeah. And one of the indicators of uh, you know, Mr. Modi's, let's say, performance uh, would be five years from now, you know, how has India's ease of doing business ranking changed, for example? Uh, the, 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 the challenges in terms of ease of doing business in China and India are, are somewhat different. Some, something common, corruption, but somewhat different. In terms of China, the primary complaint is really about the independence of the legal system. And if I have a case, you know, can I go to the local court and trust the local judges that to be fair and, and, and independent? And then another aspect is that the, the competition, because the Chinese companies are, are becoming far more competitive, technology, a brand, and capabilities, and capital, et cetera, et cetera, so the competition is a lot more brutal. Mm. Uh, and, and, uh, but in terms of government's preferential policies, uh, you know, rolling out the red carpets, the land, and et cetera, et cetera, and I would say that, uh, that, that is a very different story uh, from how India is. And primary, the, the, the land acquisition in India is a nightmare. I mean, I would just add on the Chinese side that you, you see the fundamental tension in the reform program on this very issue. So on the one hand, the Premier Li Keqiang has talked a lot about reducing administrative red tape for investments, reducing the number of approvals, all this sort of thing. And they're having some success there. While on the flip side, we see the reemergence of a pretty serious industrial policy that seems designed to, uh, to make uh, operating capability for foreign companies in particular 
at least more difficult, especially where there's uh, an industry where the Chinese are trying to groom their own domestic and ultimately global champion. Uh, let's come uh, right up on, over on the far side there. Hi, good afternoon. Adrian Gillum with the American Chemical Society. Uh, you had mentioned uh, India's uh, energy production, or rather its demands, are accounting for 80% of its deficit currently. Uh, what are some ways that you see India mo going forward in five to ten years? Uh, what do you see as some ways that they plan to diversify their energy portfolio? Um, and what are some ways you see China playing a role in that? And what are some other Asian partners, do you think, uh, might play a role in that as well? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, on the, I, I talked about, you know, the energy, yeah, that uh, uh, trade deficit in energy uh, accounting for 70% of India's total trade deficit. Uh, so, uh, you know, one of course is uh, that uh, Indian government has not been particularly helpful in terms of making it easy for companies to do exploration work. And, and so policy changes uh, that enable uh, uh, that would help. But in addition to that, in terms of diversification, uh, that India is among you know uh, uh, the leaders in the world in terms of you know build up of solar uh, uh, energy, uh, and so you know because just look at India you know in terms of its uh, geographical situation and climate and how much sunlight uh, the country gets, uh, and so solar power uh, has huge opportunity. Nuclear has huge uh, opportunity in India. Uh, and you know, and, and on solar side, of course, there are no safety issues. But also, as the cost of solar panels is declining, uh, solar power, you know, is expected within five years or, or maybe less uh, by many analysts, uh, without subsidies, uh, to become very competitive uh, with fossil fuel-based, uh, you know, uh, energy. So, so those are the kinds of things that are going on. Of course, the whole U.S. You know, India civil nuclear agreement was all about diversification of energy, right? The, the Chinese play could play a big role in the solar, because China overcapacity in the, in the, in the solar panels the production. Japanese companies are very active in exploring nuclear, hmm. uh, building nuclear power plants. So I think that the, the focus might be different. And I think that you know, India you know, producing coal and, and thermal and, and all of the Western technology in clean coal would, would, would be needed. I, I, I think that it's, it's really European, American, Japanese, Chinese companies could all play their strength into that. Uh, uh, one going. more as well that's relevant to the United States, of course, which is US LNG. Um, yeah. You know, there's been yeah. a number of non-FTA. Um, so you know, for to get American LNG, you need to be an FTA partner or specific licenses given to non-FTA partners. And of the terminals licensed so far, a couple of them have their export content, at least part of it contracted to, uh, to India. So there's a backlog of some 28 or 30 other applications pending. So if a good number of those contract with India eventually too, at least for LNG, um, the United States actually could be a, a major energy uh, trading partner with, uh, with India over the five-year uh, term that you're talking about. Uh, right next to you, we'll step back and then come back to the front. Yep. Hi, Lauren Holt, Holt Global Strategies, formerly with State Department. I'd like to know what both China and India are doing to enforce intellectual property rights. Thank you. So, uh, there's a whole chapter on the intellectual property issue. It is a major issue for both, uh, more for China at the moment, as China goes into a, a very different uh, uh, economy where innovation will drive some of the economy and not just low-end manufacturing. So the IP laws and regulations in China have changed substantially over the 10 years that I have seen it. Uh, they have moved towards more of the, of the Western style uh, protection. Enforcement may not be as uh, muscular, but remember most of the debate disputes now coming up in the IP courts, and the Shanghai and Beijing IP courts are particularly good with the judges who have been trained by EU, are from domestic Chinese companies as they compete with each other for creation of IP. So the domestic Chinese Local companies are actually fighting the IP battles now, which was earlier fought by largely the American companies and the European companies. So there is a change that has happened. 
The Indians have accepted the IP protection right from the WTO, excepting for the challenges in the drug regime, which has been a bone of contention, especially with the American pharma lobby. Uh, and there I think the challenge is not whether the, 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 uh, the IP protection is adequate or inadequate. It is a question of how do we create low cost uh, capability to provide this huge 1.2 billion people uh, drugs at an affordable price. And China has the same issue on drugs. So on these two issues, I think if you take away the, the, the IP on drugs uh, and pharma, uh, there are no issues with the Indian side. But in the China side, there has been a lot of action happening. And it's the domestic Chinese companies who are now actually challenging uh, uh, other companies, uh, imitators in courts in China. So that's the good news. Enforcement is still not adequate. That's the bad news. <laughs> uh, let's bring it back to the front here. I'm giving you your exercise, trying to go back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bill Tucker, uh, this direction is uh, uh, to Ms. Uh, Ms. Young. Uh, my firm has done a lot of work in China and India. and. Uh, uh, your comment about China companies being more willing to go uh, with a much larger time frame, is that because most of the Chinese companies are owned by the government and, and they're not private, so they're not uh, risking private, private funds? You s I think that, yes, a lot of the sectors, if you look at the power equipment, if you look at the players in the infrastructure, uh, building and, uh, and and many of them are state-owned enterprises, and uh, you know they have the they have the commercial objectives for making money, but they also have the the imperatives uh, tied into the government's overall geopolitical agenda, perhaps that making you know good relationships with India and etc. So it's a much much longer-term perspective, and plus you know when you have the state banks and and state-owned enterprises talking to each other, and there are some common common agendas there. But if you look at the private enterprises, like a Huawei, like a Hire, uh, because they don't have the fast turnovers, the stakeholders, you know, quarterly profit uh, you know, meetings, etc. And because the corporate leadership stays much, much longer term, so they can look at the five years plan, 10 years plan to plan out their games in, in India. Uh, right next to you. Yep. yep. Thank you. I'm Andre Sofazio, and I'm the chief representative in Vietnam for the Interstate Traveler Company in Detroit. Anyway, great discussion. My, my question is this. I, and the question is this. Do you, do you believe in the panel, because you talk commendably about 2020, 2025, but will these business relationships, for the reasons that you so eloquently described, can they come to pass if China continues on its now uh, renewed path of raw imperialism, naked aggression against the exclusive economic zones of the Philippines and of Vietnam, to name two of the main victims? And um, it seems that they were trying the peaceful rise bit, but in 2012, they sent this note to Prime Minister Singh, then the Prime Minister, and said, we recommend you don't pursue these contracts you signed with the petroleum company in Vietnam. It could harm their bilateral relationship. Prime Minister Singh commendably, commendably said. relatively uh, short said, here? Yeah, commendably said, yeah. yeah, thanks. He said, okay, uh, uh, we're gonna go ahead with the contracts. Now we have the oil rig dragged into, and I'm, and, what does it take to stimulate the Chinese pragmatism that this lady talked about so well? And, um, you know, what's it take to make them pra more pragmatic? Let me, the, uh, I'm not a geopolitics expert, you know, I'm, I'm a business professor, but of course, you know, these days, uh, business and uh, geopolitics and politics certainly are so intertwined that you have to, in fact, you know, keep uh, track of. And my own perspective is, uh, uh, and I don't think it's naive. Uh, it could be, uh, uh, <laughs> but I don't think so, which is that uh, see, the, the, there's no easy solution to the China-Japan tensions or East China Sea tensions. 
uh, there's obviously no easy solution to the South China Sea tensions. Uh, in fact, if anything, those are heating up. Uh, uh, and, and so what China would like to do, and this is where I'm saying I'm kind of going outside my uh, uh, business zone into geopolitics, is that China would like, ideally, for India to play a neutral role. Because it's one thing for China against Japan and the US, and I think China against Japan, US, and India. Uh, and so if India stays neutral, and one way for India to stay neutral is for economic engagement to be robust, and for border issues to remain calm, or maybe to move a little bit towards resolution, but to remain calm. Uh, in that case, India has no reason to be other than neutral, because India's interests are served best in playing really a very promiscuous game. You know, Japan and US and Russia and China and Europe, and hey, you know, come and play in my garden. I, uh, to answer the question, I've lived in Asia for over 30 years. I lived in Korea, Hong Kong, now here. My view, I've seen the Taiwan tension in the 80s, and we are now seeing the Vietnam and Philippines issue. The way I have seen it play out in Asia, if you look back, is that other than North Korea, which kind of goes wild and no one knows how, where they go, the rest of the players in the economy are driven more by keeping the economy going. I mean, Taiwan and China in the 80s exchanged missiles. There were serious issues, and yet, the Chinese and the Taiwanese do excellent business. In fact, too much of it, I suspect. And mm -hmm. the same thing with Vietnam. You had a border problem 15 years ago, which got resolved. Again, everything started, and now we see it again. So my view is that the Asian mindset in that part of the world will find a solution. The Chinese have obviously raised the game by their nine dash line, as they call it. Uh, but they will find a solution so that the economies keep going and the border issues are held in a parallel track. The parallel track will be sorted out in, in its own time. But I don't forecast, because we have seen the same thing happen earlier, uh, that this will just kind of blow up into a major war. That's from my experience in that part of the world. Who can say? I disagree on that part, but... Uh, All right, but, uh, the panel yeah. gets good now. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> we let good the before, Indians I mean. fight out. <laughs> <laughs> and the Chinese remain silent, I'm observant. <laughs> got uh, about five more minutes, so we got time for a couple more questions. Uh, right in the aisle here. Thank you very much. My name is Dong Hui Yu with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. Uh, today we are talking about a lot of uh, cooperation between the two countries. But actually, many people are talking about the competition between the dragon and the elephant. So uh, the interesting thing is when the Chinese people are talking about the uh, economic and social achievement in the past uh, three decades, uh, they believe the Chinese uh, system worked better. But many Western observers believe that uh, uh, they are more op optimistic about the future of India than those of China, because uh, the India is a democratic country. So what do you think about that? I know this is a very complicated, a big uh, question, but could you please just give us a prediction, dragon and elephant, who's going to be leading or who's going to be the winner in the next three decades. Thank you. I'd say, I'd say, 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 say two things. So, so first is uh, that uh, I think uh, competition and, and, and cooperation uh, almost always go hand in hand. You look at France and Germany as just you know, uh, one example uh, of that. So, or Europe and the US, or U US and Japan. Uh, so, so I don't think that's an issue. Uh, you know, it, it won't be just one or the other. Uh, over the last 30 years, clearly, the China model has proven to be far more successful than the India model. However, I firmly believe that if China continues on the path that it has been over the last th three decades, China is going to be in deep trouble. And so therefore, 
the past 30 years are not necessarily a good guide to the next 30 years. Except that the Chinese way is, 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 is I think it's sometimes the university media simplified it, because the Chinese way is really a combination of many ways. And the Chinese way is borrowing the best and then make it the Chinese way and, and crossing the river touching the, by touching the stones. So if what the, has worked over the last 30 years proves to be, and they have already recognized it's not going to work for the next 30 years, they have already started adjusting it and making adjustment. And I think that ultimately it comes down to the two governments' ability to adjust, to learn. And, and, and perhaps eventually they're all raised yeah. to become the top economies. And then maybe they all converge in terms of that, that common dream, democratic, prosperous, and, and well off, and, and the peaceful development. I think that if that's the fundamental you know, directions both are going, they will end up in the same place. See, I, I think to give it a historical perspective. Korea had a martial law when I used to live there. It's the most democratic country today. Ditto Taiwan. Ditto Singapore, ditto Hong Kong. So here we have countries on the periphery of China, which over the decades have moved their systems after they have grown in certain, in, in their economic terms. And that is what everyone hopes that the mothership, which is China on that part of the world, will also do in its own way. And I think we, we I mean, India accepted democracy in right in day one. And there are many people in India who would argue the other way. But the fact is, that is what happened. And over these years, India has struggled with it and come to whatever level we are. But the Chinese way will be the way Asia has done it. We have seen this, the examples in all these countries. And that is what will happen in the mothership, in its own way, as Hyun says. Girja is not planning to apply for a visa to China anytime <laughs> soon. <laughs> right up on the side here. Uh, thank you, Ernie Preek, Manufacturers Alliance. Uh, and with all the very positive, constructive potential for, for trade investment in manufacturers, business services between the two countries, a big, you would think uh, trade policy is very important, it's particularly a more liberal policy in India. So my question is, what is, what is shaping up to be, or should be, uh, the Indian trade policy? And since uh, trade agreements last almost 20 years of regrettably in some ways, all been bilateral rather than multilateral. Uh, what do you see uh, in particular uh, as possibility of Indian bilateral agreements with uh, China and with the United States? So currently, uh, the Chinese are very keen on FTA with India. The, currently, the FTA arrangements are around ASEAN. So uh, China has an, a very comprehensive agreement with ASEAN on the FTA. And India has a comprehensive agreement on the FTA with ASEAN. So to some extent, the goods can be put through ASEAN countries because both all ASEAN, 10 ASEAN countries, enjoy uh, tariff uh, protect, uh, benefits in both these economies. So in fact, that is exactly what is happening now. Because both have signed FTAs with uh, ASEAN. So the, the India Look East policy, as we call it, is via ASEAN. It, it is talking about a free trade agreement with uh, Korea and now Japan. So, uh, not in the United States as yet, but I presume one day that, that will happen as well. But at the moment, it is a look east trade policy around these countries where we already have some arrangements in the past. So, India has not been a great trading nation in terms of FTAs. The first FTA was actually signed only in 2005 with Singapore. Then it got extended to ASEAN, and that is where Indian's FTA is. Actually, it's, it's, it's pretty rudimentary from the global perspective. You want to say something? I, I don't see what's, what's India's incentive to have free, uh, you know, FTA with China. What's India to export? Because India currently exports primarily commodities. Mm. So I don't see the benefits India will get from having FTA with China, China will just sell a heck of a lot of manufactured products to India. So, so, so I don't think that is, that is the priority for the Indian government. What is the priority? 
could be on the investment front. Exactly. Uh, to totally. I mean, in fact, I predict it's hard to say about FTA with the U.S., but FTA with China, uh, India, uh, China, I put the probability in the next, you know, at least five years, maybe longer as zero. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would hope and I assume that, uh, you know, when uh, China's foreign minister, Mr. Wang Yi, was uh, in India last three days, uh, that they spent 90% of the time uh, talking about investment rather than trade issues, because that's where the real juice, I think, is. Well, with that, I think I'm going to uh, conclude the, uh, the formal part here. Um, you know, I think as we started off with, uh, we look at this relationship oftentimes as, you know, the contentiousness, and in fact, you know, sometimes encouraging that to some extent. We can only talk about India and get people's interest if we talk about it as counterweight to China, and I, and I suppose there's a, there's a counter argument to be made, made there too. But this is a much more positive way to look at the relationship. And I think too, I mean, we, we look at uh, the contentiousness as an inside the Bellway and certainly inside CSIS and other type buildings. But if you're inside companies in China and India, I'm sure the two of them are focusing a lot on the messages that these three uh, brought to us today and then are included in the book that's, uh, that's uh, available just outside this office. So I hope, I hope everybody will, uh, will join me in, in thanking our panelists and also to uh, Pranay from the Embassy of India for joining us. Thank you.